So just the other day, I was driving in the car with my four-year-old when he asked me, Lala, when will we die? I am sitting there driving down the road thinking about how I'm going to get him moved into Paw Patrol and transitioned before my five o'clock board of trustees meeting. I wasn't really thinking about existential questions of life and death. But I've four-year-olds I've learned don't really understand timing, nor do they really care. So he's looking out the window and I'm driving along and all of a sudden it's just like, how am I going to answer this? And it comes to me that, and I said, Silas, you know, death and life are part of the great mystery, and we don't know when, we'll be, when we'll, we're born and when we'll die. And that seemed to satisfy him for a little while. But it made me think later about this idea of the great mysteries, and I believe that grace is one of those mysteries as well. And I ask you today to really consider that idea of grace, of it being a currency in your life, And what does it mean to you? What does grace feel like for you? When do you call upon grace in your own life? And how do you know when you're needing to lean into those gaps in your own life to fill that space with grace? I know for me, one of the biggest places that I can get stuck is that gap between my heart and my head, between fear and love, and of course, between this wrestle that we're all in of being human and being divine. And I realized for me over my life that I can get thrown out of balance when I forget. When I forget that in my humanity, if I get stuck there, I can get thrown out of balance and forget my compassion and my connection. And if I get stuck in my beingness and just want to sit in my meditation space in my lily pad all day, that I can forget my purpose is to have a human experience. And when I can get thrown out of balance in my human beingness, I can get buckled down in fear, in smallness and in pettiness and in judgment and comparison. But what if we can lean into those gaps and not fill them? What if we allow God to fill those spaces? Because the miracle I've learned is sometimes most profound in our brokenness, in our no thingness. Because just like it's the music, the notes that fill the space to make the melody, when we allow God into those gaps in our own lives to fill those with grace, we allow God to do God's most perfect work. Several months ago, the Board of Trustees uh, had our retreat, our annual retreat in January. And um, at that retreat, we were led by Shannon Pressure in doing this activity called Kintsugi. And if you're familiar with Kintsugi, it's the art of creating something beautiful out of something broken. And at that time in our spiritual community, we were coming out of last fall, we were wrestling with some big questions and uncertainties, each of us individually and collectively as a spiritual community. And little did we know when we met in January what we were about to face with the pandemic. So as we sat there around the table that day, we took this chalice and we each took turns. Shannon had epoxied the cracks back together. This is a chalice that I believe originated from a staff member and we blessed it and she blessed it and she glued it back together. And then we each took turns using a golden uh, paint to paint the cracks and crevices of this chalice. And we blessed the chalice that day and we blessed it for it symbolized that essence right, of being broken and feeling disconnected and coming back together to create the whole in a whole new way and allowing that grace, that glitter, that gold, that God stuff to fill those gaps. Similarly, when I was a child, I sat around a table during two years of confirmation classes. You see, I grew up in the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, ELCA, which is often known as the Liberal Lutherans. And um, we would sit around the table every Wednesday from 4 to 6 p.m. in these confirmation classes. 
And there's not a lot I remembered about that time in my life. I was a teenager. I really was concerned mostly with playing Nerf football with my friends on the church lawn. I was really concerned with who was going to get to the Little Debbie snack cakes first. And of course, did I have enough change for the Coke machine, which was those great bottles that you would pull out. You know, you'd put your coins in and it would, you'd open the glass and pull out the glass bottle. And I, I had so many memories of that. And in all those years, much to the dismay of my pastor, there's only one real spiritual lesson that I remember from those times together. And it was the day Pastor Joe talked to us about grace. And something about that lesson resonated so deeply for me because it was about this idea of this guy named Martin Luther who left the Catholic Church largely for fundamental differences, but one of those core differences being that Martin Luther believed that grace was bestowed upon us. It didn't require of anything of us. It wasn't a prerequisite to being alive, that God's love was so big and so infinite that it could fill the gaps in our own lives. And so I've come to realize that for me over the years that that is a key and fundamental place that we're called into. And really, I think it's the the core definition of grace. If you look up the word grace in Merriam-Webster online, you'll find lots of definitions. But the one that strikes me is, is this one, around this idea of sanctification and repurification. I tend to think of grace in a common terms as an umbilical cord to the divine because we, were all, we are always present. We're always connected. We are always nourished by this connection as we lean in, even when we mess up even when we don't get things crossed off our to-do list, even when dishes are sitting in the sink, we don't have to get it all done. We don't have to be perfect. We are worthy of love as we are, right where we are. And there's another definition of grace that I think speaks to this in an also equally profound way, and that's that grace is a disposition to, or an act or instance of kindness Because as I'm learning, the more room I can make for myself, the more self-compassion, the more curiosity I can have about myself, the more I can make room for others. And the biggest place in my life right now where I'm having to lean into this is in this notion of anti-racism. And I'm coming coming face to face with my own ignorance, my own hidden assumptions and false narratives about race and what does that look like in our world and there's a part of me that would rather shy away and bury my head and just sit in my meditation space and pretend like these things are not happening but it's also incumbent upon me as a human and as a privileged white woman to understand my place in this how can I hold grace for myself and others it's scary work y'all it's vulnerable it's uncomfortable As part of this exploration, I'm reading the book right now with a book study called How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Similarly, in this book, Kendi talks about this notion of racism, his own racism as a black man, his own lack of awareness and understanding, and his own shortcomings in holding grace for himself and his brothers and sisters. One of the things that's really speaking to me right now as I'm exploring this book is this idea of dueling consciousness, of how do you hold these two seemingly disconnected ideas, and how do you find your way through them? This isn't a new idea that Kendi brings to light. It's actually a term that W.B. Du Bois brought to light in 1903 when he talked about his struggle to be both anti-racist, to be a black man in America, and to be an American. And Kendi talks about in this book the importance of giving ourselves grace because our identities are fluid, right? Much like our spiritual journeys, we're always evolving, we're always shifting, we're always growing, we're always leveling up. He says the good news is that racist and anti-racist are not fixed identities. We can be a racist one minute and anti-racist the next. What we say about race, what we do about race, And each moment determines what, not who, we are. I believe it's time right now in our world where we're being called into this deeper space. We're still, many of us, sheltering in place. We're still disconnected and distanced from one another. 
And I know for me in my own life, it's a time of reflection, of understanding where am I being called forward? What is mine to do? Because the world will come back together. And what does that world look like? What vision are we holding for that new, that new earth? Indian author Arunte Roy talks about this in her writing. And she says that this pandemic is about moving into a new portal. It's about moving into a new way, right? About moving through to allow this new earth to emerge. As I really explored this idea of grace, I also, of course, had to turn to our sacred text in unity, which is A Course in Miracles. Because The Course in Miracles really speaks to this idea, right, that we're facing in our world right now of these disconnects. In fact, the very definition of grace, according to Lesson 169, verse 2, is grace is acceptance of the love of God within a world of seeming hate. By grace alone, the hate and fear are gone, for grace presents a state so opposite to everything the world contains that those whose minds are lighted by the gift of grace cannot believe the world of fear is real. I just want to say that again because I want you to really get this. Those whose minds are lighted by the gift of grace cannot believe the world of fear is real. But it's a struggle sometimes, isn't it? Not getting pulled into the fear, not getting swept up into the judgment and comparison. But when we are willing to lean back into our beingness, we can see the oneness. We can feel the unity. And when we can look through the eyes of grace in our humanity, we can see differences, differences of ideas, differences of opinions, and we can hold space for one another. Because right now is a time not to shy away, but a time to dig in, a time to dig deeper into our humanity and reach higher into our beingness. And this week, as you move forward, I'd invite you to just ask yourself one question. When you feel that twinge of fear, ask yourself, am I buckling down in fear, or am I leveling up in love? Because the more that we can level up in love, the more we can make room for all of life. We can create a world full of grace where we honor each other, where we see each other, where we hold each other, even if we don't agree. And this, I believe, is what it means to have heaven on earth. One of the most simplest and most complex acts that we can do is to allow ourselves to just simply be and breathe in grace. Sometimes when we're in the midst of that uncomfort, you know, discomfort and not sure and uncertainty, we want to fix it. We want someone to fix it. But the more we can lean back into the breath, the more we can lean back into our breath to connect with the divine, we can remember the great I am. Or use the mantra Hamsa, I am that. Because as we know in our unity second principle, our essence is of God. We are inherently good. The God essence that this God essence was fully expressed as Jesus the Christ. One of the most profound books that I'm also reading right now is called The Universal Christ by Richard Rohr. And in this book, Rohr talks about this notion of Jesus being a Christ, being that essence in the world. But he talks about it in a way that I haven't heard many uh, fathers, many uh, of the you know, Christian faith talk about that in a really all-inclusive way. In fact, he talks about um, God as an all-inclusive God, as opposed to a tribal God that many religions over the years have created. And his message is very akin to that here in Unity, where he talks about that God loves things by becoming them. He writes, Christ is the light that allows people to see things in their fullness. The precise and intended effect of such light, a light is to see Christ everywhere else. 
In fact, it is my only definition of a true Christian. A mature Christian sees Christ in everything and everyone else. That is a definition that will never, never fail you, always demand more of you, and give you no reason to fight, exclude, or reject anyone. For when we live in this space of grace, when we allow spirit to fill the gaps of our understanding, those gaps between head and heart, those gaps between human and being, we allow ourselves to be in that Christ light. So as we close and as you move into your day and hopefully move into this workshop this afternoon with Roger Teal and think about in your own life what bridges to break through you're experiencing or want to experience, I'd invite you to remember it's as simple as looking at the sun. In his final chapter of The Untethered Soul, Michael Singer writes, your relationship with God is the same as your relationship with the sun. If you hid from the sun for years and then chose to come out of darkness, the sun would still be shining as if you had never left. You don't need to apologize. You just pick up your head and you look at the sun. It's the same when you decide to turn toward God. You just do it. If instead you allow guilt and shame to interfere, that's just your ego blocking the divine flow. You can't offend the divine. Its very nature is light, love, compassion, protection, and giving. You can't make it stop loving you. It's just like the sun. You can't make the sun stop shining on you. You can only choose not to look at it. The moment you look, you'll see it's there. So as we close and you move into your week, I'd invite you to tune back into your umbilical cord, to level up in love, and to remind yourself of the Christ that you are, because it's not enough to hold this grace that we feel from the divine, but we must share it in the world. We must hold it for one another, because that's what we came here to do as human beings.